Executive Director of the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. Thank you for taking the time to participate. We are a national coalition of over 380 organizations working to fight and ultimately end the hepatitis B and C epidemics in the United States. I encourage you to visit our website, www.nbhr.org, and consider joining your organization if not already a member or by signing up for our listserv as an individual. You can go to www.nbhr.org slash join for more information. Before we begin today, I'd like to go over some housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. Slides from the presentations and the webinar recording will be made available to register. It will also be on NBHR's website. All lines have been muted to eliminate background noise. You may submit questions at any time during the in the chat function or by emailing Tina our senior program manager at tbroder, that's T B R D E R at nbhr.org, tbroder.org. I also want to thank Tina for organizing today's webinar. We will have a question and answer period following all of the presentations. Today we will hear from four advocates who have led successful efforts to expand hepatitis C treatment access in their state. They will share strategies, lessons learned, and advice for other advocates. I would like to personally thank all of our panelists for their leadership and dedication to fighting discriminatory hepatitis C treatment restrictions and for taking time today to share their experience and their thoughts. I will provide a brief each speaker before his or her presentation. Our first speaker today is Sheldon Taubman. Since 1991, Sheldon has been in the benefits unit of New Haven Legal Assistance Association Incorporated, concentrating on issues related to access to health care, particularly under the Medicaid program. He is involved in individual client representation, litigation, and legislative and administrative advocacy, and specializes in multi-forum advocacy. Sheldon was one of the plaintiff's attorneys in a federal lawsuit against the Connecticut Department of Social Services and one of the four Medicaid HMOs then operated, operating in Connecticut, HealthNet Incorporated. The lawsuit alleged noncompliance by the defendants with due process requirements and terminating medical treatment in all aspects of HealthNet's Medicaid business and failure to provide timely access to prescription drugs. It's a certified class action five years later. He has since been involved in advocacy around issues concerning access to prescription drugs, among other Medicaid services. And I'd like to particularly thank Sheldon for providing one of the very first uh, victories around treatment access. Very difficult two and a half year that's in the community, and I'd now like to turn it over to Sheldon. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, what I'd like to talk about in 15 minutes is what we did and how we did it. Um, uh, a year, uh, well, a year and a half ago, month, and we had a lot of the restrictions um, that a lot of people are seeing still, um, um, where you know the basics. Of course, the biggest one is metaverse uh, score of F3 or F4, but then also barred if you have any kind of cancer, um, barred if you were pregnant. Uh, next slide. Um, prohibitions on being treated more than once. You get, get this treatment uh, once and that will be, no matter what, never see it again. Um, a bar if the patient is taking other drugs, which may reduce effectiveness, but still the drug could work. Um, and a statement that you can't use the drug outside of the FDA approved indications. In it, um, it was specified, as I'm sure a lot of people are still saying, that the drug must be prescribed by certain narrow specialists, many of whom are, are, are few and far between under Medicaid, and it's hard to get in to see them. And lastly, and I don't know whether other states have seen this, but we had a particularly egregious due process violation in all this, in that in order to get approval for the drug, you had to request prior authorization on a specific form. Form, in addition to saying, you know, putting information in, requires a certification. I hereby swear, didn't say Bibles, but I hereby swear that um, that the criteria of my patient meet are above are all met. 
So basically the very, very narrow criteria they set forth, you had to certify that they were met or you could not even submit the form, which meant that providers, of course, were self-censoring and not, uh, not even making the request on behalf of their patients and telling them, sorry, the bad news. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we decided we had to attack this, and of course you all know that on the other side is the argument that that the manufacturers are abusive, <clears throat> are charging extremely high prices for their drugs, um, and the states were scared and 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 are saying that it's going to put us out of business. So as we have done in a few other situations in the past in Connecticut, um, we recognized we had to have a multi prong strategy, and that involves both the lawyer types who can point out the specific legal issues, but also the policy types and the advocates who are concerned about the broader picture, um, advocates for uh, people with HIV, advocates for people with mental illness, et cetera, because of the interactions of all these medical conditions. Um, so we decided to do it in a sort of uh, systematic way. The, the, the legal letter, which went through why um, mostly federal law, but also state law is being violated, and I'll talk, talk about state law in a moment, why it might be relevant to you in your state, um, but we it's important to have the clear laying out the, the federal law violations because that, of course, was the threat of litigation, which Medicaid agencies try to avoid. Um, we also recognize, though, that the, the broad problems with this <clears throat> policy are going to have to be um, uh, um, fleshed out a little bit so so that makers understand that, yeah, it, it's illegal, but also this may not be even a good idea, and particularly it may not even make sense financially. And that was really, really important because, of course, the whole argument is we're doing this because we have to because of the money. Um, in addition, we were fortunate, and I'm hoping in other states it's the same, we were fortunate to have clinicians who were willing to work with us, um, who saw patients on a daily basis, and who um, you know, could explain in detail what this really meant, the fact that we were denying access. So um, in addition to the advocates working together and, and, the, and the lawyer letter, we, behind the scenes, coordinated with the clinicians who then approached the medical director for the agency and try to convince him that what they're doing now under this policy is really problematic from a medical clinical point of view. And of course, <clears throat> as we, we tend to do, and I'm sure folks are use, doing as well in their states, we use the media to call attention to the severe access issue. And I do want to emphasize one of the words we used a lot and was, I think, effective is the word rationing because rationing is this terrible, terrible word. And the of course is that in Medicaid, there's all kinds of rationing all the time, everywhere. But if you use the word, it concerned. So I would say that the two most important words we used in our media strategy was rationing, cure. A lot of treatments help, but these new line drugs, of course, bring a whole new answer because they actually can cure and be done with the need for any further treatment. We also talked with the agency and recognizing behind the scenes, recognizing that there is a problem with the cost of the new drugs, and and so we encouraged them to negotiate with the main to see if they could get the better rates. Um, our letters, the the two letters that were sent, are on the NVHR website, and that's shown on this slide. So briefly. Um, uh, next slide, please. Briefly, in terms of the federal law vi uh, violations for those who are um, likely to be doing these demand letters or even bringing the lawsuits, um, you have to look at the, the federal law requirements which apply to prescription drugs, outpatient prescription drugs under Medicaid, and the requirements are very strict. If a drug is FDA approved, the drug has to be offered unless it's in one of a few very narrow categories such as benzodiazepines which for which the states have the authority to exclude. Not applicable here. Any of the, the drug, if FDA approved, and of course these drugs are FDA approved, it has to be provided. The only discretion that, that the state might have is to restrict it in terms of the FDA approved reasons or purposes as well, and, and they also have to cover off-label usages 
if it recognized in one of three compendia which are cited in, in federal law. Um, outside of that, the state does not have the authority to restrict access to the drug um, where it's medically necessary. So um, that slide, um, excuse me, this slide has the citations to the federal law provisions in, in, the, in the part dealing with uh, prescription drugs. Um, next slide, please. Um, in addition to those specific requirements applicable to um, drugs, so a lot of, there, there are several statutory and regulatory provisions that have long been used where other kinds of services have been restricted and generally successfully plaintiffs have sued on these provisions. The first one you see there is, is the basic regulation on amount duration and scope. Um, also the, re the statutory requirement that services be provided with reasonable promptness. Also the right to due process and that's relevant in our situation as I said because we were denied the right to even request something and get a denial notice that could be the basis for appeal. I should emphasize when talking about federal law violations that there is a significant issue of enforceability of certain provisions and so in our letter we tried to emphasize uh, provisions which are have been found to be enforceable by private parties in federal court, but there is a major issue with that, and there are some experts at N Health and other words, otherwise who can help you with um, making sure that you draft a complaint or even a demand letter consistent with uh, provisions that are enforceable. Um, next slide, please. Um, in our case, we were able to also cite state law violations, and I said this might be relevant because you, are, you may have a definition of medical necessity in state law or regulation, which is similar to ours. And the key provisions in our state statutory definition of medical necessity for Medicaid, which I use here, is one is that part of medical necessity is preventing medical conditions. Obviously, that's terms of, of a fibrosis requirement, which of course is too late, you've already caused damage. If there's a way to prevent that, that's part of medical necessity in our definition and possibly in yours. And the second thing I pulled out is the provision that says they can substitute a requested treatment with another treatment that's presumably cheaper as long as it's at least as likely to produce equivalent therapeutic or diagnostic results. And as we discussed, and as you all know, the new line drugs are clearly superior to interfere on, et cetera, so they really can't make that argument. But take a look at your statutory or regulatory definition of medical necessity to see if it's similar to that. Next slide, please. Um, so, so in addition to the, the advocate's letter tied with legal violations, we then, the second letter two weeks later, uh, that's signed by lots of folks, not just the lawyer types, goes into the, the other issues which I've laid out here. It mentions the legal issues, but that wasn't the pr predominant thing. We talked about public health, reducing transmission of HCV. If you actually cure somebody, you reduce the number of people who are going to get the disease in the first place, which is of major benefit. In addition, if you provide a cure so the person doesn't need future treatment, you're, you're making a big investment down the road, including in terms of the, the, final, the financial situation. Um, we also noted, and I think a lot of states have this, we had just passed before, the, the session before, a requirement that m there be mandated screening for HCV for certain people of a certain age group. And w the point of that, of course, was get their, they could be asymptomatic and you want to see if they have it, and if so, then give them appropriate treatment. Well, this was completely undermining the whole point of that screening mandate passed in state law the year before. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also emphasize what you know the data shows in terms of how m people on Medicaid are disproportionately minorities, and therefore, if you're restricting access in Medicaid, particularly, you have a disparate impact. You you can exacerbate um, health disparities. Um, and then, and I'm the most important thing is is that actually saves money to do this. It will save money if you pay for Harvoni and Savaldi, and that's because the old line drugs were are not that cheap. They're expensive anyway. They have a very high incidence of expensive complications which then have to be treated and the probability of cure is so much lower. You see between 40 and 70 percent. Part of that is it's very hard for a lot of people to tolerate the treatment before they stop it. The bottom line is you've spent a lot of money giving this, these folks this treatment for no benefit. So you then have to provide further treatment in the future. And our Medicaid director in our state Medicaid agency was persuaded, I would say mostly by the clinicians, not by us, although probably our letter didn't hurt, um, 
was persuaded that it's actually a good deal. It will be cost effective to start providing these drugs now. Um, next slide, please. Um, obviously, as I said earlier, we, we, we did work to get a lot of media coverage, and you really have to do that in order to uh, magnify what you're saying to the agencies. And if you craft your message appropriately, you'll get, you'll get coverage and it'll be sympathetic, such as rationing, such as cure, such as people be, who are poor being denied that's life-sustaining. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our success, which, which resulted in, in May of 2015, occurred um, after, or I should say at the same time, as the state succeeded in getting a better deal from the manufacturers of the drugs. So, you know, the, the price here all the time is it costs $84,000 per course of treatment. That is really not true. I don't know the exact figure, but my understanding it's it's more like in the 50s or the low 60s. So the, be aware of that because there's a lot of misinformation about that. But ultimately, all these arguments resulted in the state caving, a combination of our advocacy and getting the better deal, and that occurred without litigation having been brought. But what we did not have at the time our advocacy back in, in February and the spring of last year, we did not have CMS saying anything on our side. And that's what the really wonderful thing is, is that as of uh, in November, November 5th, they put out guidance, um, which is very clear in telling states they cannot use, they cannot restrict to F3 or F4, and they cite some of the general law that uh, supports this, and, and they make it clear that HCV drugs are like any other drugs in terms of the mandates, and those mandates, as I said, if the drug is FDA approved, and if the drug is being prescribed for a, a purpose set forth in the label or one of the off-label usages that are set forth in those compendia, states don't have the right to restrict any further. In addition, not relevant in our state, but in most states, um, there's contracting with MCOs, and the letter goes on to say that MCOs basically have to live by the exact same requirements as are imposed on the fee-for-service program or on the states directly under Medicaid. And the only out they give the states is that uh, if, if you don't want to impose this on your MCOs, then you can carve it out and be responsible for directly taking it out of the capitation. But one way or another, the, the strict requirements they set forth and the guidance is going to have to be provided. Um, it will also be talked about later the litigation that's been brought successfully in Washington State and there's other cases pending. And of course, you've all been reading about several states, one after another, uh, caving. And I think that we, we should give a lot of credit to CMS um, as well as the litigators for, for states finally caving. So I do think that, uh, to wrap up, I, I do think we're really going in the right direction. And as states that you know tend to really dig in, like Florida cave, I think it says a lot that the the momentum is on our is on our side. So consider writing demand letters, using the media, and certainly relying upon the case law so far and the CMS guidance in in making your case. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sheldon, uh, for walking us through your strategy and also for highlighting the CMS guidance. I would now like to introduce Emily. Uh, Emily Hirio, MPH, is the Director of Federal and State Affairs for Project Inform. In this role, she is responsible for the organization's hepatitis C policy activities at the national level and in California. In addition, she chairs the California Hepatitis Alliance, a statewide coalition working to end hepatitis B and C in California, and she also chairs the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable Steering Committee. Prior to these roles, she worked at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, where she had served as the viral hepatitis and integration coordinator and spent many years as a health ed educator and frontline provider working with harm reduction programs. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. OK. So I'm going to um, talk about um, what what we've done in California in terms of increasing access to hepatitis C treatment, specifically in Medi-Cal, but I'll also touch on the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Next slide. So just for a very quick background, Project INFORM is a 30-year-old uh, 
consumer education and health advocacy organization that started in response to HIV and about uh, Ryan would know better than me, but, but probably about seven years ago, uh, the organization added hepatitis C into its mission. Um, and uh, we do a number of consumer education materials around hepatitis C, as well as um, participate in a collaboration to, uh, to operate the Help for Hep phone line, which is a toll-free line for consumers and their friends and families um, to get both information and um, assistance with with uh, services, it's uh, sort of a remote case management service um, via phone. Um, and a, a, a significant amount of healthcare advocacy in California, some kind of broad-based and then some specific to HIV and hepatitis C. And we work in coalition with partners like NBHR and others to do um, federal, federal advocacy. The California Hepatitis Alliance is uh, celebrating its 10-year anniversary this year, and that is a um, coalition of organizations around the state that have an interest in ending hepatitis B and C. Um, and so a lot of our um, state hepatitis C advocacy work um, is done in close collaboration with the California Hepatitis Alliance, and Project Inform manages that coalition. Next slide. background, um, we believe that there's a significant burden of hepatitis C in California. As you all know, California is a very large state, um, and the estimate is somewhere between, you know, 600,000 to 750,000 Californians are living with hepatitis C, and I tend to err on the higher end of the estimate. Um, next slide. So um, as Sheldon mentioned, we definitely use the word rationing. And um, by way of background, um, in 2014, uh, after the uh, FDA approval of Sovaldi, uh, the state of California developed treatment utilization policies that limited access to the, to, at the time, that new medication and then to new other medications as they became approved. Um, and I'll talk more about what those policies said, but our position is that any any requirements that restrict access that don't fall in line with the professional guidance developed by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases and the Infectious Diseases Society of America, um, any restrictions that don't follow their, their guidance um, are rationing and they're purely cost containment measures. And as Sheldon outlined, many of those um, rationing and cost containment measures are illegal. Next slide. So uh, in fiscal year 2014 and 2015, uh, the policies in Medi-Cal, which is our state Medicaid program, and the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which you'll hear me refer to as ADAP, um, really were quite restrictive and very in line with a lot of other restrictions around the country. So in Medi-Cal, uh, treatment was only available for people with advanced liver disease, so a fibrosis score of three or four, which is advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis or certain very limited extrahepatic conditions. And extrahepatic just means conditions caused by hep C that are outside of the liver. Uh, it prohibited treatment for people who use drugs or alcohol unless they had six months of abstinence or were actively engaged in drug treatment. And that phrase was never defined, so you can imagine the variety of interpretations um, of that phrase. And then in the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which provides um, financial assistance for, um, for people with HIV who meet certain uh, requirements in terms of income and other requirements. Um, they were covering hepatitis C drugs, um, but again, like the Medi-Cal policy, only authorized treatment for people with advanced liver disease. Um, so that was that F3 or F4 restriction, and again, certain limited extrahepatic conditions. Next slide. Um, so just, I think, important background. A third of Californians uh, have Medi-Cal. That's about 11 million people. Um, and 75 to 80% of those people are in managed care plans rather than in fee-for-service. And you heard Sheldon mention MCOs. You'll see me abbreviate um, them in this slide set as M MMCs, Medi-Cal managed care plans. Um, but these are you know, health plans. Some are um, county-run. Some are um, you know, private corporations, 
um, that provide um, health insurance um, and provide the managed care services that are funded through state state dollars for people who qualify for Medicaid. Um, so most people with Medi-Cal in California have a managed care plan, um, and that means the plan itself uh, interprets the state's policy and operationalizes it. And in California, we have over 30 managed care plans, um, so there's 30 different interpretations of the state's policy. And some of the um, ways that that played out um, was that some managed care plans instituted additional restrictions beyond the treatment utilization policy. For example, the state policy said nothing about a uh, requirement around certain specialists. It, it did make some reference of the, of the prescribing provider being experienced um, in treating hepatitis C, um, but the way one managed care plan in a very large county interpreted that was um, that they limited uh, the prescriber to one specialist in the entire county. Um, so all patients with hep C who were prescribed hep C treatment had to be seen and prescribed treatment by that specialist. Um, you can imagine the bottleneck that was created there. Um, some plans uh, interpreted that six months of abstinence or active engagement in drug treatment as really being um, uh, requiring abstinence only. Some plans denied every initial request they received. Um, and then some refused to allow infectious disease or primary care doctors to prescribe um, and only would allow hepatologists, gastroenterologists to prescribe. Next slide. So um, we did a great deal of advocacy, which I'll talk about in a moment, but um, to get just to get to the results to see. Uh, uh, Medi-Cal issued a new policy that was effective July 1st of 2015, and that allows for treating people who have a fibrosis score of 2, which is mild fibrosis, or moderate fibrosis, I guess, um, to F4, which is cirrhosis. So it expanded um, the fibrosis scores um, a little bit. It also allows, allows for treating many people regardless of fibrosis score, which includes people with certain extra hepatic conditions. Um, but it also includes an expanded list of people with co-occurring conditions such as HIV, hepatitis B, diabetes, and debilitating fatigue due to hepatitis C. Um, so that really opened the, the net much wider than it had been. And then the part that um, was probably most exciting um, at the time, though now, and forward-thinking at the time, though now California is falling behind with all the great advances of advocates in other states, um, at the time, this was an exciting development, which was that the policy allowed for treating people at high risk for transmitting the virus, regardless of their level of fibrosis. And that includes people who inject drugs, women of childbearing age who wish to become pregnant, um, and gay men who have, and they, this is their terminology, not mine, high risk sex. Um, so uh, that really opened up the door for this idea of cure as prevention or treatment of that if we you know treat the people who are at highest risk for transmitting the virus um, that's how we'll you know end the hepatitis C epidemic so this was very exciting and at the time um, one of the few states to sort of have this thinking in their policy and then in the ADAP program um, the policy was updated um, in for the fiscal year of 1516 um, which really allowed for treatment of all, regardless of fibrosis score. So that was also a, a happy development. Next slide. Um, so how we advocated for these changes, um, we did a lot of public comment to the Department of Healthcare Services, which manages the Medi-Cal program, and to the State Office of AIDS, which manages the ADAP program. We coordinated and submitted sign-on letters in response to their proposed policies. We included public comment with suggestions for how the policies could be improved and aligned with clinical best practice and professional guidance. Um, and to inform these comments, we consulted with experts in the field, including uh, hepatologists, ID specialists, primary care providers who've been treating hep C, and also legal advocates. Next slide. Um, so those are just some samples of letters that we did. and. Uh, some of them were in coordination with NBHR. Next slide. 
And uh, we consulted with clinicians about on-the-ground access issues, um, in particular issues with Medi-Cal managed care plans. And we connected those clinicians and their patients to a legal aid group called the Health Consumer Alliance, which is pro bono legal aid, a network of pro bono legal aid groups around the state that are um, charged with helping any Californian with um, access issues related to health care. Um, and, and that was a val very valuable way for providers and patients to keep a paper trail of what was occurring and to make sure that um, the state was getting all of that paperwork so they were aware of what was going on. We've also worked closely with the National Health Law Program um, to track these issues and have worked with them um, to report them to the Department of Healthcare Services, and that's an ongoing area of both advocacy and collaboration. Next slide. We had meetings with the Department of Healthcare Services. Oh, and I just see a typo there. It should be DHCS, not DCHS. My apologies. Um, so we had meetings with, with them in person and on the phone. They started in response to the original policy, and they can have continued. We bring clinicians to these meetings, um, and uh, we really ha it's been very valuable to have the clinicians explain to the Department of Healthcare Services staff what they're seeing on the ground. And um, never underestimate the power of doctors speaking to doctors. So the, some of the leadership at the Department of Healthcare Services are physicians um, and bringing physicians to them to explain what they're seeing in terms of access challenges um, has been a really helpful um, way to convey what's going on. We also participate in advisory committees. There was a governor's high cost drugs work group that we participated on and an ongoing Medi-Cal managed care advisory group where we bring many of these issues. Next slide. And then um, we talk with the press directly and connect journalists to providers and patients. And if you just keep clicking, Emily, um, those are just some samples of headlines where we've um, spoken to journalists and helped to um, connect providers and patients. And I, I, Sheldon mentioned this. I think it's really important to get um, the media involved um, to talk about issues other than a thousand dollar a pill headline, but to talk about um, kind of the reality of what um, treatment access restrictions mean for patients um, in in the state and uh, what it means for people's lives. Next slide. Um, just a quick note um, on some uh, health coverage outside of the Medi-Cal and the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Um, Covered California is our state exchange. So California is a state that expanded Medicaid um, through the Affordable Care Act. And so Covered California um, is the umbrella for that um, state health care exchange. And um, in many, both you know, Covered California plans and other commercial payer plans, uh, prescription drugs are tiered usually from one to four. And generally, one is low-cost generics. And four is considered specialty drugs or high-cost drugs. Um, and depending on the health plan, the cost sharing for these specialty drugs can be up to 30%. Um, so that's the, the amount the patient has to, has to contribute to access the drug. Um, in 2015, all of the new Hep C drugs were Tier 4 in every covered California plan. And in 2016, this is still largely true with a few exceptions. Um, and while it's hard for us to fully assess it, we do believe that many California plans as well as private payers are engaged in similar rationing as the public programs. Next slide. Um, working in coalition with um, another a number of other healthcare advocacy groups, um, my coworker Ann Donnelly sat on the Covered California Specialty Drug Work Group. And one of the successes of that effort was um, encouraging and, and successfully getting Covered California to institute a cap on specialty drugs. So the cost sharing is now capped since January. Um, at, for most people, it's capped at $250 per drug per month. Um, that's you know, mostly for the gold and silver plans. People in platinum plans pay $150 per drug per month. People in bronze plans pay uh, $500 per drug per month. So this is still a significant amount of money for people. Um, they have to you know, spend this money to reach their deductible. Um, 
but it is a significant improvement from 30% of the cost of the hep C drugs. Um, so it's a step toward access, but obviously still, um, still more needs to be done there. Um, so I just wanted to speak to that a little because we talk about Medi-Cal a lot, but, um, but you know, the private marketplace is important. Um, so work remains. So we've had some successes, but there's plenty more to do. And my goal is to work myself out of a job, but I haven't done that yet. Um, so in Medi-Cal, access challenges are significant. The utilization of hep C drugs is extremely low. Uh, the estimate is there's about 200,000 Medi-Cal beneficiaries with hep C. And you know, only 4% or maybe fewer than that have been treated. Um, so you can see 2014, um, you know, just over, what is that, about 2,100 people were treated. In 2015, um, you know, about 5,800 people were treated across both managed care and fee-for-service. Um, so that's a, I, I call this pitiful. Um, I think it's a pitiful um, outcome. And we're still see, hearing a lot of reports of disparate fidelity to the state policy by Medi-Cal managed care plans. And that really translates into inequitable access for beneficiaries around the state. Um, you know, I like to say, you know, if you live in San Diego and have Medi-Cal, and you live in um, Sacramento and have Medi-Cal, even though it's the same, it, on paper should be the same benefit, and the state is paying, you know, a similar amount for that benefit, your access to Hep C treatment may be wildly different depending on which managed care plan you have. Um, and we're, you know, we're in discussion with legal advocates about whether to continue our administrative advocacy approach, which is really those meetings and letter writing um, and trying to work with the state, or if we should start engaging in legal advocacy, you know, meaning a potential lawsuit. So that's um, an area of strategy and discussion right now. Next slide. Other challenges, um, getting a handle on what's going on in the private marketplace. California is a big state. There's a lot of plans. It's really hard to get access to some of the private um, health insurance plans, prior authorization forms, and it's difficult to get data to know how many Californians have been treated for hep C in the last few years. Um, another challenge is understanding access in the state prisons. There is a policy in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to only treat people who have a fibrosis score of three or four. Uh, we don't know what utilization has been. So that's another area um, where uh, we need to do further investigation. Next slide. So um, it, these are some of the great folks that are part of the California Hepatitis Alliance, and that was us in Sacramento doing advocacy. Next slide. So suggestions, I um, would say stay on message, and the message is that everyone with hep C deserves a cure. Work in coalition um, with organizations and individuals affected by hepatitis C. Um, patient stories are really important. Uh, collaborate with legal and medical experts, and that, that's been invaluable to have um, sort of, you know, I see myself as acting as the convener. Um, and really getting these experts and individuals affected by hep C together to figure out the solution to this access issue. Don't recreate the wheel. So talk to folks on this call and in other states to get examples of letters and other materials. And um, I'm sure it will be mentioned later, but NVHR has a great um, treatment access uh, web page with a lot of these letters that we reference in our presentations. Talk to journalists. Um, they often won't quote you um, directly, but they might use what you say to direct and they definitely will use you as a resource for referrals to patients and providers. And then, you know, be involved with the bureaucracy. Go to your Medicaid programs meetings, get on their email list, um, ask state leadership hard questions, and be tenacious, because this is a marathon, I think, <laughs> not a race, as a race. Next slide. And then um, I just want to thank all of you on the call for being part of the movement to cure all. And um, I'll just also quickly note that um, we have done see that's not about treatment access, but really about getting state general fund dollars for prevention and testing services um, and linkage to care services. And um, we've had some success with that in the last two years. So I'm happy to talk with people offline 
if you're interested in um, how to do budget advocacy in your state. And I think the last slide has my contact information. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, really appreciate it. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Don Fishbein. Uh, Don joined MedStar Health Research Institute in the role of scientific director, viral hepatitis research in July of 2015. Prior to this, she was on the Department of Medicine faculty at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, creating a program for testing and linkage to care and treatment for persons with chronic hepatitis C infection. She was funded as a PI on a CDC hepatitis C testing and linkage to care grant, testing primary care patients born between 1945 and 1965 for hepatitis C for those not previously tested and who did not have pre-identified risk factors, and, on the, and as a PI on two Gilead focus grants for linkage of hepatitis C positive persons out of care for greater than one year, and MedStar health testing and linkage to care initiatives. Initiatives. Don's career passion in chronic hepatitis C is culminating at such an incredibly exciting time in the field. Her focus is in health services research, investigating the barriers and best practices for addressing and improving the entire cascade of hepatitis C care from screening, testing, linking to treating and curing persons with hepatitis C with the ultimate goal of eliminating this disease. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, we can keep that up. Can I move along? Can you guys move the slides along? I can't move them. Hold on one second, Tom. We'll find out what's going on. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to show you briefly a slide. This is um, a little bit about our program, and this is mostly data just from Washington Hospital Center in our testing and linkage to care program. And I, I want you know us to start looking at this um, slide or anyone who's presenting this work as um, uh, the cascade of care is that we really want to start flattening out the cascade of care. Um, and I, I, we're pretty proud of our linkage programs, but again, we, we are linking into one program, and so it's not that difficult. But we are making movement um, over the past couple of years in our number of prescriptions written, and we're at almost 50% at least that we're writing prescriptions on everyone who we've seen with RNA. And we're actually getting you know, a good proportion of those um, onto treatment. So next slide. So uh, my approach, we, you know, we've been asked several questions. So my approach is, um, well, I'm a physician, mm -hmm. and I have some flexibility because I've moved into the research side, so it doesn't really matter when I write my research grants, but I have much more flexibility with my time, and I think that that is something that a lot of physicians who have, you know, pure clinical jobs have a really difficult time getting time away to do any kind of advocacy work. But living in Washington does have its advantages. So, um, you know, partly I've been getting involved with Medicaid, but it's really getting involved with a lot of other state, local, national organizations. HOSTA, which is our, our local, you know, our HIV and hepatitis um, group through the CDC, uh, Health and Human Services, becoming active on their action plan. You know, lately we've been stakeholder with NVHR plus IDSA getting involved in the Alliance for Patient Access, the Hepatitis Therapy Access group, physicians group, on the NVHR Best Practices group, working in collaboration through research partnerships, which is really important through PCORI, the Gilead Focus, through our um, the NIH Award with Clinical and Translational Science Award. And then um, I'm sure there are others. But lastly, just getting involved with the DC Healthcare Finance and DC Medicaid 
Plus, we also, so I'm part of MedStar, which is a large regional um, healthcare company, um, you know, a not-for-profit company. But we also have our own insurance, and it's a, a Medicare insurance, an employee insurance, and a managed Medicare insurance, managed Medicaid. And um, our Medicaid is one of the three that are approved for DC Medicaid. So, you know, I sit in a nice position because I can actually speak easily to the MedStar managed Medicaid people. And, um, and I've had a, a easy conversations with them, and they're actually quite reasonable. So I'm not sure what this approach is, if it's, you know, le legislative or whatever, but it's sort of a hodgepodge and getting involved whenever I can or whenever people ask and I could, um, and I have the time. Um, so next slide, please. So what's been the process for change? Um, well, I think it's, you know, it's an ongoing process and it's really been, you know, started since I joined um, Washington Hospital Center, which was in 2012, is, you know, when the, basically when the CDC came out with their recommendation for testing and linking to care. So, but then, you know, semeprovir and sofosprovir were not approved until 2013. And um, so it's really been an ongoing process, I think, you know, mostly since really 2014, basically. And I really got involved with DC Medicaid when DC Medicaid approached several of us because they actually discovered that they were not spending as much as they projected. And they wanted to know why. Were, were, you know, were they overestimating their numbers of people infected? And were providers not putting in pro their uh, prior authorizations? Which was very, it was an interesting time because it was that their process was fairly onerous and no one really knew what to do. Plus, they did not approve Harvoni until February of 2015 and they had us to a meeting in the spring of 2015. And DC Health Finance, you know, held this meeting with HOSTA clinicians and NIH and I was part of the NIH that set up the hepatitis C in the District of Columbia. So, you know, D.C. is a, it's a very small place, so, um, you know, this is not going to be generalizable to every state, but I do find that D.C. is not as restrictive as other states, and they are small, and it's a small group, and they're reasonable. So I do urge, um, you know, all clinicians and um, to get involved in their state um, Medicaid, DC, uh, their health finance, because they really do listen to you. I, like Emily was saying, telling the story of the patients and what's going on and how these medications are really making a difference in their lives is really important, and it is important to give a um, face to what's going on. So previously, when, when they started with restrictions, um, it was always F2 and above, F2, F3, F4. So it was not as restrictive as other states. Um, but that included patients who also had HIV and who also had hepatitis B. At the time, it also included a urine drug screen, including marijuana. Although they say they weren't going to do anything for marijuana, they, they, they were allowed to restrict for it. And there was a letter of medical necessity for all patients. And, you know, it's, um, it is a barrier. The letter of medical necessity, even though even if you do a form, you still have to put in, each clinician has to put in some clinical um, history, and it does take a lot of time. So if you're trying to he treat hundreds of patients, it really is a big barrier. So um, since since I've gotten involved with them, um, they um, they now don't have they no longer have a urine drug screen, and they basically have language in their prior authorizations that say that uh, patients providers will work with patients on adherence and abstinence. Um, but there's no restriction on it. And basically, says on adherence, so they could take the appropriate course of medications. They also, um, you know, a lot of people when you use a fibro short test, you get a, a staging between F1 and F2. So they've agreed that all of that F1 to F2 can also be included in their um, approval. Um, HIV and hepatitis B is now included at any stage of the of um, fibrosis. Like I said, there's no urine tox. And also, there's no letter of medical necessity needed if you use their preferred drug. 
which I still think is a, is a good, you know, it's a good step. Um, their preferred drug at DC Medicaid, however, is Vicira. I'm not saying anything bad about Vicira because it actually works well, um, but there are barriers to use it, and um, you know, both, you know, because of um, adherence and it's a twice a day drug, often have has to be used with ribavirin. But it is their preferred drug. So you basically, if you want to use Carvoni or Zepatir, you do have to write a medical necessity. The other um, things are that, um, like Emily was saying. They do allow for, if you, in your letter of medical necessity, you do state that patients have other extra hepatic manifestations of hepatitis C that they, you can also get approval that way. Um, what they still have in their restrictions are, um, um, like they do have this very clunky form that the patients have to sign, the language that I don't even understand. And I read it to the patients, and I sort of laugh as I'm reading it because I can't understand it. And they um, they do include verbiage that says that only one course of medication will be included in the DC Medicaid lifetime. But it basically says um, if I don't if I don't um, follow the regimen how it's prescribed, I understand that only one course is allowed. So it's a little um, you know I don't think anything could ever be. Um, enforced from that type of language, but um, I, and I haven't seen it yet. Um, and that they really haven't budged on, and I brought up pretty much at every meeting, well, except for today, that form is just not, it, it just doesn't really make sense. Um, they also used to have the language in there, you had to have a tox screen and you had to be three months drug free, and they don't um, restrict. The other um, Restriction that they did keep in their prior authorization form is that um, it is restricted to providers who are ID, you know, who are specialists ID, GI, or hepatology. So they never had just the GI or hepatology clause. But they also say or primary care providers who are in consultation with a specialist. And you know, I haven't made that um, my point to change. And when we were looking at the forms and um, we didn't change that because in DC, the access to those providers or in consultation with a provider is not that difficult. So I did not make that the, um, you know, one of the points that I've really um, tried to change with them. The other thing I wanted to add is that that letter, that CMS letter, um, although DC Medicaid was always talking and trying to change things and working together, um, they really um, responded to that CMS letter pretty quickly. And that was really, I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, okay, next slide, please. So also one thing that changed, and um, you know, when we talk about the states, we don't really talk as much about the pharmacy benefits managers. And I think that that was a huge barrier um, in getting approvals for patients. So I could tell you that we used to have Xerox as our pharmacy benefit manager for DC Medicaid, and it was ridiculous. I could never speak to anybody. No one would call back. They would, um, the for, you know, like you never had a, a good answer. Like we would have to fax forms in, and they would say we never got the paperwork. Even though we had a transmission notice that had, clearly had the time, they say, sorry, we never got the paperwork then they would have to restart the process, and it was taking so long. And um, then we worked, I, I, I kept pushing, and um, they fired um, that pharmacy benefit manager. And they hired Magellan. And I don't have any experience with any of them, but I will tell you that Magellan has been a drastic, drastic um, difference. They will have a website where you can actually um, submit on a website. and. The approvals we've been receiving on Medicaid patients have been um, occurring within 48 to 72 hours. It's been pretty. It's been pretty amazing. Um, the other thing is that I continue to attend the uh, Drug Utilization Review Board meetings uh, once a month. I actually was at one today, and every time I'm on the you know Google um, Hep C access page that I think um, is is I think it's run by NVHR. Um, every time there's something that's shared on there about states removing all restrictions, I immediately send the emails on to the people who are in charge of it. 
Um, we, you know, I, I'm there to actually um, give the clinical picture as well and discuss the new medications whenever they need it. They're, they are really respectful of um, time um, and um, of our opinion. So I think it's important for clinicians to sort of make themselves known as an expert in the field. So the other thing is because of um, the managed Medicaid with MedStar, you know, we'll work with them. So when, when DC fee for service Medicaid started changing their restrictions, I sent an email to um, our managed Medicaid um, plan head and she said that they really do try to mirror it. So they've already started mirroring the DC fee for service as well. You know, I'll get an email saying, what are your thoughts on Zepatier? It's so much cheaper. Can we use it? And, I'll, you know, of course, I'll respond with, of course, you know, happy to talk to you more about it. So I think it's important to sort of, you know, make yourself an expert in this and, and have these conversations. Um, you know, for future efforts, I, I think that um, all of us, I know we have a lot of um, fighting to do even on removing restrictions, but I keep sort of my point on these HHS calls is to start um, um, presenting data so that we could actually have universal testing, ED testing and linkage to care, changing the CMS documents, um, and then obviously creating a goal towards elimination. So next slide. Um, so just a, as a lesson learned, you know, from the physician provider standpoint is to really get involved. It's, it's not easy to be involved. You know, it is, uh, it, you know, it's a lot of time and, um, you know, a lot of people, you just don't have the flexibility to do these things and take time off. And it honestly wasn't until I moved over to the research organization that I had more flexibility. Um, I think we're going to hear later on in the next um, round of talks about other physician advocates. I apologize if I am forgetting anybody on this, but I just know I'm on such a, you know, a constant basis, a constant um, conversation um, and communication with Cameron Graham, Lynn Taylor, Stacey Truskin, Bob Gish, um, and I'm sure there are others. And again, give the patient perspective. Be the, be the Medicaid or whoever, be the clinician expert on it. Um, and one thing that I haven't heard yet is just about the pharmacy benefit manager, but it, they did make a difference. And I think it's important to address the state Medicaid team, not, not go through the pharmacy benefits manager, but actually speak with the um, healthcare finance group. You know, get invited and go to these meetings, go regularly, go to you know, the P&T committees. Uh, you know, those we have on a quarterly approval basis. Become a stakeholder when you can. One thing I did learn also is that to submit the prior authorization process uh, packet whenever you can, because when DC Medicaid had some extra extra funds, they said, okay, let's approve everyone who's F1 to F2. But and then they said, okay, you have to make a broad announcement of this, you know, so all the clinicians know, all the providers know, and they were like, oh, well, let's we'll do the ones that are submitted. And I was like, well, that's not really fair because, you know, like I was following the rules, you know, basically that, you know, whoever, whatever rules they had, I was following. So I think one thing I learned is just get them in anyway and write a good letter. I didn't put this on this, but it's important to write a, um, a, a strong letter that is clear, distinct, so that it doesn't have to take a long time to go through the, um, the process. Um, I do want to say that not every physician is going to be on board with this. You know, I agree, have one, one point. You know, my point is that everyone should be treated if they want to be treated. And um, today at my meeting, they asked, they said, so you're really treating um, patients who are F0? I said, of course I am. You know, anyone who, anyone who is hepatitis C positive with virus should be treated. And I just, I stick to that line. Um, but, you know, her point is that she's really, they're really upset about all the pricing. And I, I don't disagree with that. And I think as uh, advocates, we have to work on sort of all these different levels. But, you know, like you talk to Medicaid and tell them to start negotiating better for their pricing, that they have the ability to negotiate, that they should negotiate. And um, now there is competition. Um, one thing that I talked about um, with, the, with them today is, you know, about Zepatier, and they said that they're waiting for um, the next um, uh, the Gilead drug to be approved to see what the pricing is, and then they're going to make decisions across the board about what the preferred drug will be. Um, and, um, you know, when I go there, it's to advocate for all patients and all providers, not just, not just my own. 
So I think that's probably all I have to say for today. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Don. Uh, our final speaker um, is Michael Nimberg. And Michael is the Executive Director of the Hepatitis Education Project, HEP, a, no a, a nonprofit organization dedicating to end the hepatitis B epidemics. Founded in 1993, HEP works with patients, medical providers, public makers, and provides direct services and advocacy for some of the community's most underserved and marginalized populations. And Michael's done some amazing work in Washington and nationally, and will end the presentations by uh, covering those. So thanks, Michael. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'll just start by saying that you know we've been uh, working with patients for a long time, and we've worked in the public sector and the private sector, and uh, really at this point, uh, I agree with Don. Anyone who wants to get treated and cured for hepatitis C. Uh, should have that access, and so we're looking for uh, universal coverage. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> what happened in Washington State after Sofosbuvir and Semepervir were approved in late 2013 uh, really happened uh, similarly across the, the country in, in different states. Uh, in Washington State, we actually had a period of several months where both in the uh, private sector and public sector, patients were getting approved with, uh, with very little problem. Uh, and it wasn't until the, the end of the, the first quarter in 2014 that uh, really managed care organizations in Washington State started to put up uh, barriers. Uh, Molina was the most egregious actor they actually were uh, were very slow from the beginning, but by March in 2013, uh, it was very very difficult to get approval if you were a Medicaid patient in Washington State. Uh, we did see that by uh, certainly by the end of 2014, most commercial payers had followed the lead of the state Medicaids, seeing uh, that they had really a a model that they could use as justification. Um, also troubling was the uh, HCV guidance that came out from ASLD and IDSA. And while it was not their intention, the fact that they did prioritize populations for treatment really served as that, uh, that reference point for rationing these drugs when they first came available. Uh, one of the things that we did in that first part of 2014 was, uh, aside from working with individual patients and trying to get their denials uh, overturned, was draft a, a template letter for clinicians for their cirrhotic patients. So this was uh, a case where there were people with cirrhosis. We had uh, treatments, semepervir and sofosbuvir that was very effective in getting these people uh, treated and cured and they were being denied. Uh, that template letter uh, was distributed around the country. It was used uh, successfully all over. Uh, sadly, uh, of course, there were those with uh, cirrhosis who did decompensate and, and die because they were not given access to those drugs. Uh, one place where we did actually agree with the managed care organizations was to, uh, to get a carve out for hepatitis C in Washington State so that all hepatitis C treatment would be provided through the fee-for-service mechanism. Uh, managed care organizations were saying that they had not budgeted for these new expensive therapies. Uh, we saw that people weren't getting uh, approved for treatment and we both, the MCOs and the uh, the advocacy community approached the healthcare authority and said, "This is really a problem. We need to get these patients access. The easiest and best way to do that now, similar to what had done in many states with HIV drugs, is to carve this out so that there is one protocol that will be followed, irrespective of uh, you know where the patient ends up in a managed care organization." And, uh, and that carve-out continues to this day, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Uh, next slide, please. So the car out did start in uh, January of last year. And of course, it was great that there was a standardized protocol and it wasn't the luck of the draw which managed care organization you happen to be assigned to. The problem was that we were still only treating those with uh, F3 or greater fibrosis. Uh, we had also uh, been working with the healthcare authority around the, uh, the abstinence and sobriety requirements and uh, began to slowly chip away at that. Um, we did see from the beginning uh, a six-month sobriety abstinence period that a patient would have to prove to be eligible for treatment. Uh, over the course of 2015, uh, that was reduced to three months and in some sort of uh, alcohol or drug treatment. And then uh, eventually we were able to get the, the abstinence and drug use uh, exclusions removed entirely. Uh, there does remain in place uh, a psychosocial readiness component, uh, but as of last fall, uh, there is no drug use or sobriety uh, exclusion for Washington State Medicaid. Last summer, we uh, drafted a white paper for regulators, uh, state and federal, really spelling out some of the uh, legal and regulatory uh, arguments for why these exclusions were illegal and discriminatory. Um, we created a template that is still available on the NBHR website, uh, probably a little bit uh, outdated. Uh, we drafted this before the HCV guidance removed the uh, prioritization table, but after they had made it unambiguous in August of last year that anyone living with hepatitis C with a life expectancy of more than 12 months should be considered for treatment. The uh, state insurance commissioner here received the white paper with a request for a meeting and uh, we, we heard nothing. Uh, there was uh, acknowledgement that they received the letter, but uh, they did not follow up on the, the meeting request. What we did do that was very effective was get uh, the chief medical officers for pretty much all of the major healthcare systems in the greater Seattle metro area to sign on to a letter decrying the discriminatory uh, uh, practices of insurers. And that letter with about uh, 15 signatories went to the insurance commissioner and we received uh, communication the following day requesting a meeting. So uh, I would say that if your advocate voice is not being heard, it is very helpful to enlist the help of uh, experts in the field, and, and that will sometimes open some doors. Next slide, please. So for the end of last year, uh, we did uh, manage to secure a meeting with the uh, insurance commissioner here in Washington State. And uh, the Office of the Insurance Commissioner agreed to survey uh, national and carriers that work in uh, Washington State around their HCV coverage policies. Uh, they did include the, the most recent HCV guidance. The OIC did say that they actually issue uh, some communication afterwards short of a directive to uh, carriers stating that there is a legal requirement to provide access to these drugs. They reneged on that, uh, that promise, uh, but the, the survey did result in all of the major carriers in Washington State eventually removing the fibrosis restrictions uh, for the most part around hepatitis B. There were a couple of large uh, pairs in Washington State that uh, remained in 
and I'll address some of those in a moment uh, with, the, uh, with the class action lawsuit that was settled earlier this year. Uh, there do remain a handful of smaller in uh, Washington State that have not complied with the, uh, the most recent HCV guidance, but, uh, but they are very few. Next slide, please. So as we were doing this work in Washington State, uh, we reached out to several national carriers, and uh, two of which were United and Cigna. And in letters to their chief medical officers, we copied the insurance commissioners in uh, some of the large states. And as a result of those communications, uh, we did get requests from several states for uh, more information on what the, the coverage restrictions were. Uh, we had uh, communications with the, the chief medical officers for both United and Cigna. Uh, United had removed the fibrosis restrictions, but they still had the abstinence and uh, drug use restrictions in place. Uh, we spoke with them, uh, and they said that they would address that at their next PNT committee meeting. Uh, with their own experts that they use, and uh, this would have been in March of this year. To date, they have not changed the abstinence and drug use restrictions. Cigna, on the other hand, uh, relatively quickly after the uh, letter that we sent, uh, actually slightly after the fact, this week of March, that they had removed the abstinence requirement effective March 1st. So that was a, a very significant victory. Next slide, please. Subsequent to the request for more information about coverage restrictions, uh, we were able to get the Illinois Department of Insurance and the, the equivalent of the New York Department of Insurance to investigate the, the coverage policies of carriers in those states. Uh, New York, as you know, has uh, seen some great progress in access to treatment. Uh, the Attorney General has gotten involved there. And uh, just uh, last week, we learned from the Illinois Department of Insurance that uh, they had been speaking with uh, Healthcare Service Corporation, which uh, is uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield for several states, and that HCFC had updated their prior off removed fibrosis, and when we reviewed the policies that they forwarded to us, it did not include any sobriety or abstinence restrictions. Uh, so another, uh, another step in the right direction. Next slide, please. Florida is another state where we've seen some, uh, some great movement in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had contacted uh, who crossed the shield through their PBM, Prime Therapeutics, uh, and addressed concerns around inappropriate coverage restrictions. Uh, we have been going back and forth with them. Florida actually had a, a very progressive insurance commissioner who, uh, in a, a bit of a uh, headbutting contest with the, the governor there, stepped down a few months ago. Uh, but as that was happening, uh, we were contacted to discuss the requirements for commercial plans coverage of hep C drugs uh, in Florida, and also how C drugs would be tiered, and really looking to minimize out-of-pocket costs for patients. So that uh, those recommendations were just sent to the Florida Office of the Insurance Regulator, and. Uh, we will hopefully be getting some information uh, about that in the next couple of weeks. Next slide, please. We also, when we initially drafted the white paper last summer, uh, sent it to the U.S. Department of Labor, and in particular the Employee Benefit Security Agency. And while it took a, a little bit for them to be convinced that this actually did fall uh, within their purview, 
they they did they did agree to, uh, to look at HCV access issues in light of the ERISA laws. Uh, ERISA regulates employer and group health uh, insurance contracts. And particularly, they were interested in the, the non-discrimination provisions. Uh, that is an ongoing conversation, and our next uh, call with the Department of Labor is next week. Next slide, please. So uh, this uh, is not the, the lawsuit that you're thinking of. Uh, this first one was actually two class action lawsuits filed against uh, regional payers here in Washington State, Regents and Group Health. <laughs> and uh, they both had restrictions in place, only those with advanced liver disease. Uh, these complaints were filed in January of this year. And within two weeks, each of the carriers capitulated. Uh, it was really uh, unexpected, uh, but uh, a wonderful development. Uh, group Health uh, dragged their, their feet a little bit on the abstinence and uh, drug use restrictions, but uh, they eventually complied. And not only that, they did send letters to all of their members who had been denied treatment because they were not sick enough, telling them that they were now eligible for treatment. Um, the there was a second lawsuit uh, against the healthcare authority, which oversees Medicaid, which we'll talk about in just a second, and the public employee benefit. Uh, the the public employee lawsuit is still being litigated. Uh, just this morning, there was uh, a hearing uh, looking at motions to. Uh, uh, dismiss the preliminary injunction and it's it's really unconscionable that we've got uh, especially now the uh, uh, the Medicaid resolution and public employees covered through the healthcare authority in Washington State still have to have F3. I don't see how this is going to continue for very long uh, and just about 10 seconds ago, I got a, a, an email popped up from uh, Ellie Hamburger, who's uh, one of the plaintiff's attorneys, uh, an incredible uh, team out here in Washington, uh, pit bulls, as it were. She said that the, the hearing went well this morning, so I'll be interested to, to follow up with everyone and how that went. Uh, last slide, please, or penultimate slide. So. You're all aware of the uh, federal court ruling uh, three weeks ago today uh, requiring that the health care authority uh, begin to offer HCV treatment to all Medicaid patients in Washington irrespective of their liver disease. Um, the first week after the, uh, the judgment came down, the health care authority was uh, non-committal. When asked what they were going to do, if they were going to appeal, they said they were uh, weighing their options. Uh, a week after the court ruling came down, they did say that they were going to comply with the ruling, which uh, was a good idea because when the feds tell you to do something, especially through a court order, it's usually a good idea to do it. Uh, and we were very pleased. Um, next slide, please. The court order gave the healthcare authority 60 days to report back to uh, the court on their compliance with the court order. And uh, what we saw, unfortunately, was the first attempt at an updated treatment protocol this past Monday. And it was absolutely uh, a non-starter. While they had removed restrictions around fibrosis, they had added restrictions around time between antibody and uh, RNA tests or two RNA tests. So there was a six-month 
requirement between either an antibody and RNA or two RNA tests, uh, which was nothing more than a delay tactic. Um, they also were not offering to uh, treat women of childbearing age who planned on getting pregnant. Uh, they had a 14-day limit uh, on drugs for patients at the discretion of the, the provider. Uh, it was really, it was a mess. They, they included uh, an option for retreatment with peg interferon, which uh, was, uh, I don't know what that was. Uh, so we, we responded to the medical director of the healthcare authority uh, that uh, this was absolutely unacceptable. Uh, we and uh, the, the vocal group here in Washington State, uh, the, the drug users union, uh, had planned before the, uh, the court ruling came down a rally and protest at the healthcare authority uh, this past Wednesday, two days ago. When the court ruling came down, we wondered whether it was moot now that you know, we had treatment for everyone, or so we thought. Um, when this first updated treatment protocol came out on Monday, we realized that this was a, a group to really uh, let the healthcare authority know that, uh, that this is not okay with a show of force. <laughs> and there we are on Wednesday. Uh, we had a protest. Uh, the Medicaid director, Marianne Lindeblad, and the medical director, Dan Wessler, did come down. Uh, Lisa Brodock, who is a, a law professor here at, the, at Seattle University, had also drafted two rulemaking petitions that would uh, make HCV treatment and also new breakthrough drugs immediately available to all Medicaid patients. So those petitions were hand delivered to uh, the Medicaid director and the medical director. Um, I was able to sit down with them on uh, Wednesday, right after this uh, process, which they had learned about that morning through social media. Um, and really, I think they are at the place where they are comfortable with the idea of open access. As has been mentioned uh, by uh, several panelists today, the costs for these drugs are coming down. States are getting these regimens for under $30,000. Politico, uh, in an article a few months ago, spelled out 28K uh, that New York State Medicaid is getting. So when people talk about, you know, 84 non-starter, even 50K, is, uh, is not what a state Medicaid should be getting. State Medicaid should be getting these drugs for somewhere in the low to high 20K. Uh, it will be very interesting to see what the, the uh, Gilead uh, soft Belpatasir combo is priced at, but uh, regardless, we've got very effective treatments for most patients with hepatitis B that can be had by state Medicaid for under uh, Utilization is also far, far less than state Medicaid has been projecting. And so this sky is falling scenario that state Medicaid directors are painting. And our state Medicaid director was as bad as any. She took the number of Medicaid patients with FC in Washington State, about 25, 27K, multiplied that by 84,000 and said that's how much it's going to cost to treat everyone. Well, it's not. It's now about you know, 25 to 30K. And if we're lucky, we're going to be treating two to 2,500 to 2,500 patients a year. So, you know, we were allocated about 220 million dollars in the last or in the current biennium to treat hepatitis C. We couldn't even spend that if we wanted to, given the current utilization and prices for hepatitis C. So, uh, with that, I will wrap it up. We've got about five minutes for Q and A, but uh, I'll stick around uh, for as long as anyone. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Michael, so much. Um, so the, well, those were four really amazing presentations um, covering a variety of different perspectives and tactics. Um, and um, what I have taken from all of them is the optimism 
that people are feeling um, now that we're seeing some success after some really hard-fought battles. So I want to thank the, our four presenters, not only for the presentations, but again for, for the amazing advocacy. Um, we are uh, running up against the time for the webinar. However, I do want to encourage folks to enter in your questions through chat or send them to tbroder.bhr.org. And if we don't get to them today, we will um, we will send appropriate panelists and, and get answers to you. One question that's come through, um, and Sheldon, uh, it's for you. Um, you mentioned in your presentation um, obviously, the argument that you made with Medicaid that um, that it saves money down the line to provide access to the cure, um, but how did how do you overcome the challenges? You know, a lot of state Medicaids come back and talk about how you know um, Medicaids just look at that year's budget and and cost savings down the line aren't really that factored in when they're dealing with the stressful budget period for that year. So, wondering if you have any any suggestions on how to overcome that argument. Well, the answer to that argument is really easy for us in Connecticut, and I acknowledge not so easy elsewhere. Um, and by the way, that argument that people move and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to see the benefit of investing was made by, I believe, every Medicaid director in the state, uh, in the country, when they co-signed a letter to the feds begging early on, I don't know if people are familiar with this, but begging for help from CMS from the burden of these new drugs so they shouldn't have to pay for them. And that was, they, they rebutted the argument that it's a good cost investment because of that, that they might move. In Connecticut, we don't have MCOs, managed care organizations. The risk is on the state and stays on, so you don't have the thing of people moving from MCO to MCO, particularly, particularly for the elderly disabled population. They're likely to be on Medicaid for a long time. So really, the state will still have the responsibility. In states where um, where you have fee-for-service, at least for the elderly disabled populations, you should be able to rebut that by saying these people are going to be around. And so sure, to, to the bottom line for this year may not see it right away, but you'll see it by the bottom line for the second year and certainly the third year. So that would be the argument. In the case of MCOs, just look at the bottom line, not, not just for this year, looking for the bottom line for this quarter uh, to satisfy their shareholders. I think you just have to use the, the, the legal argument that they are obligated to do exactly what the state itself has to do. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so that actually leads to a great second question. Um, and Emily, it was it was sent for you. And um, certainly welcome others to chime in because it's more than California. But it's specifically around advocacy with the managed care organizations. Any, um, any strategies that you've put into place to um, um, to make sure that managed care organizations are following the uh, So there's two things. One is really encouraging providers and patients to go through all of the appeals process, the independent medical review processes, and to, to document everything because the State Department of Healthcare Services has been very clear with us that you know, that we can tell them about the aggregate experience of patients and providers and what we're seeing as barriers through managed care plans, but they won't act on anything without having a paper trail. Um, so it really puts the burden and providers who are already overburdened with many other things um, to do all of that. And that's where our collaboration with the Health Consumer Alliance has been really important because those are legal advocates who can help patients and providers create that paper trail and can take a lot of the burden off of the providers um, who are off, you know, who are trying to treat people and not not really interested and don't have the time to be engaged in bureaucratic wrangling. Um, so that's one way. And then the other is we've had some calls directly with health plans that have that have continued to come up. And you know, Michael mentioned Molina. And Molina is such a plan in California. They're um, one of the larger managed care plans. And we've heard from providers in multiple counties uh, that ongoing issues getting treatment for their patients through the Molina Medi-Cal managed care plan. Um, so we actually had a call with a chief medical officer and their lead pharmacist and some other leadership at Molina and the National Health Law Program. Um, you know, out, we wrote them a letter, and then that was followed up by a, a phone call um, outlining sort of in aggregate all of the issues we've heard 
and asking for some solutions. So there's no resolution with that yet, but I, you know, I'm hopeful that that we wanted to try to do a friendly approach first before, uh, you know, and let them know what we were hearing and seeing before pursuing other modes of recourse. Um, but we'll see where that goes. Um, that you know, that might end up. You know, there hasn't been any discussion, but I could see that ending up in a legal, legal fight. Uh, great, thank you. Um, so, if uh, we're going to stay on for another few minutes, because I've got a question and for Michael. Um, so, if um, everybody's able to stay on for just a few more minutes, that would be great. And um, please do continue sending in your questions, and we'll get those answered. Um, for Michael, um, the way I read this, so a lot of the success that you've had seems that you've been able to really identify key decision makers and establish relationships with them um, in order uh, to to advance your advocacy. And are there any uh, lessons you've learned or anything that you think has worked particularly well? Um, sort of, you know, uh, identifying key decision makers in payers um, and and kind of making those cold calls or or do you have for folks who who don't have a lot of experience doing that kind of establishing those relationships. Yeah, you know, uh, on the on the legislative side, which we didn't really talk about, um, but we were able to get through our state legislature, as I mentioned, somewhere around $220 million to pay for the carve-out, uh, and the health care authority hasn't even been able to spend probably half of it. Um, at the legislative level, uh, one lesson that I learned uh, many, many years ago when I first started here and we were trying to get uh, a state strategic plan in place through the legislature and were unsuccessful, uh, the then Senate Health Committee Chair, uh, you know, seeing how dejected I was, uh, Michael, this is a game of inches. And you came in this session. You, uh, you educated a lot of us, uh, you know, many of whom had never really heard much about hepatitis C before, and you'll be back next year, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll have a, a better result next year. And, uh, and sure enough, we did come back the following year and get that, uh, that strategic plan through a budget proviso. Um, I think, uh, you know, identifying uh, strategic legislators, uh, the health care committees in uh, both chambers, the, uh, the ways and means and budget shares are uh, also very important. And understanding that you know, this, this really does take time. Uh, and you know, if, if you don't get it through this year, then hopefully next year or the, the following year. Um, I think, uh, as I mentioned, you know, some of the best success we had with our office of the insurance commissioner after going to uh, you know, community leaders, specifically the chief medical officers for the largest hospitals and healthcare systems in uh, in the greater Seattle area, and that you know that rang some bells that our initial uh, letter did not. So uh, you know, lean on uh, friends with influence and and get those uh, get those introductions. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, and the final question we'll put out is for Don, hopefully still on. Um, still on. That, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, the need for providers to be involved in advocacy, which is great and something that we, we really encourage as well. Do you have any thoughts on um, for providers who might be on the line on how they might encourage their patients to get involved in advocacy? Of course, not every patient will be will want to or be in a place to be, um, be able to do so, but do you have any experience uh, engaging your patients in advocacy? Um, thanks. That's, that's a really good point. So I have some experience in it, not on an organized basis, though. One thing that I didn't get to say, encouraging clinicians to be advocates, but um, you all, as the advocacy organizations, I think really help us in bring us, you know, bringing us to meetings and helping bring our voices out. So I would say the same goes for maybe organizing our patients. So keep asking us 
you know, if we have patients, because I do have, I really do have a lot of patients who always say, I want to be involved in this. You know, I'm always encouraging patients on a small basis to empower themselves. I'm trying, you know, we had support groups going for a little while. I know that um, Ronnie Marks and her group, she, you know, has some patient empowerment. So I think it, it is, um, it is important to get patients empowered, and I think we have so many who are willing. Um, it's just now a matter of organizing them. So perhaps that could also be a next step in what we do. Um, so we did have, you know, we had one of our patients come and speak um, to um, one of the Senate meetings. Um, I think that you all organized also. Yep, and um, she was really great and. You know, for a while, she didn't even want to disclose anything to anyone, but she also then, before that, she was willing to do a video with someone, and then since then, she actually, um, she actually did um, like a, um, for our MedStar board, she was actually um, interviewed and did a beautiful, beautiful piece um, on, you know, her, on just her plight, and, um, and that was for our medical, not our medical board, but our, um, uh, the annual report. So, you know, so she's come forward and we could, I know I could get more and more patients to do so. I just haven't had as much time as I would love to. Great. Thank you. And I do remember um, uh, you had your patient speak in, in front of, at a congressional reception and share yeah. your powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know we've run over. I want to thank again our, our great person and for everybody for being on the line today on a Friday afternoon. I know I feel more inspired after hearing the successes, um, and I hope everybody else does as well. I encourage you to send in questions to us at MBHR, um, or if you want to be connected to any, do let us know. And um, it was mentioned before, we have uh, revamped the treatment access resources on our website. So if you go to our website and click Hepatitis C Treatment Access, um, we have um, a significant number of resources divided in for patients and providers, and uh, there's research, there's advocacy, um, and I encourage everybody to check that out. And if you have any resources you would like added, um, send them to us, and we will make sure they get up onto our website. Um, so with that, have a great weekend, everybody, and thank you for participating.